Darius, Josh, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Hi, Tisha. Thanks for having us. So before we dive into QCP and what you guys are up to, could you tell our listeners a little bit about your background? Um, so I know Darius was an FX trader and, and he keeps talking about how that really helps him in what he does today. Um, but could you both give a quick introduction about what you were up to in your previous life? Sure. Um, yeah, so, um, I, I'm Darius. Uh, so I used to be a macro trader. That's where, that's where I started my career at a fund called Diamond Asia. That's a uh, $5 billion fund out of Singapore. You know, traded cross assets, uh, specialized in Asia FX and derivatives. Um, and just before going into crypto trading, uh, I was at last at BNP Paribas in New York, uh, managing the Asia FX and bonds book there. Um, you know, um, the FX, uh, like, like Pusha mentioned, the FX experience helps a lot in crypto because, you know, very quite similar in terms of liquidity profile, the different idiosyncrasies for settlement. Um, so yeah, um, that's my background, Josh. Uh, I used to be a lawyer in another life, uh, pre-crypto, um, and spent a lot of time at high growth startups. So building out companies like Rocket Internet's Lazada, Zalora out here in Asia, and some of the e-commerce businesses with them in Latin America. Um, then I was involved with Uber, building out Uber's business here in Asia uh, and Australia and parts of Latam as well. Um, for doing a lot of VC investing on my own as an angel and uh, eventually also helping uh, go check with their M&A and expansion across Asia. Uh, and looking into crypto, I was more speculative. Darius brought on the trading expertise. Uh, I was more into the tech and um, more from eavesdropping on another person's conversation a long time ago at a dinner party. Um, so fell into it in the rabbit hole just like anybody else. Uh, and the way we came together is um, more through mutual friends um, and having gone to neighboring uh, high schools. Um, and that's sort of depicted in the staff because we run a pretty centralized team based here in Singapore. It's almost 30 people now. And almost all of them exclusively come from these schools. <laughs> so yeah, it's um, that's how we've grown in the last year and a bit. So it's a tight-knit alumni, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I think it's all about trust in crypto, right? So you go with people you know, and that's really how we've grown so far. Um, although these days, I'd say it's fair we're hiring outside of the circles as, as we're looking to bring in more talent. But yes, to the listeners, we are hiring. <laughs> all right. I'll be sure to point that out. I'm sure there'll be a lot of people who'd be very excited to work with you guys. Cool, thanks. Have a great so so let's talk. So Darius, I know you mentioned about your cross-border arbitra arbitrage experience while you were still at BNP, uh, which you actually leveraged to build up your capital. Could you talk a little bit more about that experience? Was that in a personal capacity? How did you exactly go about it? Um, and, and, you know, a little bit more details about uh, that entire journey. Sure. So, I mean, um, my, my, my entry in the crypto was very, very capital markets focused, right? Um, didn't know and didn't know much about Bitcoin or Ether, but the first thing that interested me was a was the big arbitrage opportunity between exchanges uh, cross border, like the one is the ones in the, the one in Korea that went up to like 60, 70 percent. Uh, for me, you know, uh, so it wasn't the tech that, that interested me first. It was the trading opportunity. So you know, it started in like late 2017, early 2018. Uh, saw the opportunity and, and couldn't resist it. Started doing it uh, while I was working at a bank, you know. Um, and uh, just to give you some context, you know, in, in traditional capital markets, you don't get anything close to these kind of arbitrage opportunities, you know. So, so for, for me, it was it was uh, very very enticing. And I think that's how we started, right? Uh, uh, approaching the space from a capital markets angle, um, doing the cross-border arbitrage. We were doing it in Korea, uh, all over Asia, some in South, some in South America. Um, so, you know, yeah, that's how we started. When you think about it this way, we both had, us and two other partners at QSP, we've all had full-time jobs when we were starting the business. It was something we did as a hobby in our free time. So think about weekends where we fly somewhere, then we, some sort of arbitrage opportunity, set up accounts, set up the exchange access, um, just hustle and get it done, then come back to our day jobs on the weekday. That, that's, I mean, that's an incredible story. And so... Uh, did you build out banking relationships? Because I know some of the countries, you know, in South America, you mentioned in Korea, they have capital controls, not the easiest to move around capital. Uh, so did you b build out those relationships um, to carry out these arbitrage activities? Because it's not the easiest yeah, to pull up these things. 
a lot of it was done on personal. So I used to live in Mexico. I used to live out in Buenos Aires and, and around the continent. So I had a lot of friends and contacts there. Uh, Darius was in Brazil for a while as well um, while he was still at BMP. So I took advantage of uh, time off there. Uh, and in the midst of all that, you know, in, in whenever we had the time and the relationship, we'd see how we could leverage that to open up access, right? Yeah. So, I mean, like Josh said, right, started on a very personal basis, uh, personal bank accounts. Uh, it's just like a real hustle. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, I think that's, a, that's a very exciting story. I mean, um, so, I mean, let's shift the focus to QCP a little bit. So, uh, you know, has, so QCP started sometime in 2017, 18? 18. Oh, late 2017. Late 2017. Yeah. The, yeah. the last, the last year has been a bit, of a bit of a blur for you guys. Um, so, I mean, has it been, I mean, so what, what are you guys up to at QCP and has your focus been sa the same all along since you guys started or have you had to adapt because of, you know, how the market has evolved? Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So, so just to correct, I mean, the time shift, right? We restarted arbitraging late 2016, early 2017. Uh, that was when we were first doing it on a personal basis. When QCP started, uh, um, the arbitrage was already at the tail end. The markets were getting more mature. Um, so QCP started as, you know, in the same approach. We, we, we saw crypto from a very capital markets angle. Uh, we, we were focusing a lot more on uh, spot trading, uh, as well as right now, a lot more into trading crypto derivatives. Uh, the primary business is prop trading, you know, so we, we trade a lot of, uh, of uh, um, Futures, listed futures, OTC, we trade a lot of forwards, options, and we also run a spot desk as well. So uh, that's been the focus for, for QCP and uh, uh, that, that's the, the bulk of our business. I think perhaps for the uninitiated as well, we'll kind of break that down. Um, you know, we refer to it as prop trading, it's proprietary trading, meaning that the balance sheet is entirely our own. So we trade capital that's entirely owned by QCP and there's no outside investors. Um, upon this, we have a large team that derives new strategies that we look to deploy into. Some of that is automated, some of that is manual. So it's a whole research team, a back office, a mid office, and um, we have a, a whole team dealing with KYC and AML to ensure we're entirely compliant as well whenever we have a client facing trade. And that's what uh, Darius was referring to as a spot desk, which is where someone comes to us, um, you know, he wants to buy a large amount of Bitcoin or Ether, for example, and we will execute that based on market prices and he would be dealing with us as a counterparty. So that's where the real OTC business takes place, not a lot of the brokerage stuff that you might see in the market. Yeah, um, so I think it, I mean, you mentioned the uninitiated, absolutely. I mean, I think, so, I mean, it really helps, um, you know, some of the people um, who are, who are not part of the, you know, sort of the quote unquote, the traditional financial ecosystem, but are starting to kind of trade crypto, buy crypto, you know, they look at charts all day, but you know, you guys come from a, you know, traditional background, you've been, you know, traders within the larger financial institutions. Um, so could you talk a little bit, I know you, you know, you mentioned, you know, some of the derivatives that you, derivative products that you guys trade in. Uh, but could you talk a little bit more in terms of, you know, the kind of platforms that you're using at the moment and a little bit more about your strategies as well, right? So um, what kind of opportunities you mentioned that part of it is automated, part of it is kind of manual, a little bit of I'm presuming is algo driven and, and the rest is sort of based on, um, you know, some of the views or the, you know, some of the views that you might, you guys might have. So a little bit more details in terms of like what your trading strategies are. Sure. Um, I think to start uh, the, some, some context, right? Uh, the, the crypto liquidity in the space, uh, although most people know exchanges better, uh, I would say most of the liquidity is off exchange on the OTC market. Um, I would say exchanges make up for maybe 15, 20% of, of the market of the liquidity, uh, the rest of it, most of the big trades and uh, the, the depth of liquidity is usually off exchange, where you have instead of uh, trading peer to peer on an auto book, you are facing a market maker who takes on the, the risk. Um, and uh, with that, you know, we tend to be a very OTC focused shop for that reason as well. And also because uh, 
um, my background in FX is very OTC, uh, was very OTC dominated. Um, you know, so we do use algos to, to trade on exchange, um, but uh, not, not, our, not our core focus of ours. We tend to be a bit more uh, a macro in our approach. You know, we do take some uh, directional risk. We, we uh, look out mostly for structural inefficiencies, dislocations in the markets. And these tend to happen a lot in derivative products. Uh, the spot market is not big, you know, um, it, right now it's about 120 billion the entire market cap. The spot market is not big. So most of the capacity for strategies uh, and opportunities uh, are found in the derivative markets. Um, so yeah, so, so those, that's where we spend most of our time and most of our risk is in, are in those products. Um, and uh, yeah, so so as to our strategies, you know, we, 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 we take more structural positions, uh, spreads, um, you know, uh, options depending on the volatility profile at the time. Uh, but you know, not, nothing, nothing, uh, nothing, it's not really high frequency style, right? It's more, it's more, it's more systematic, but in a macro way. Yeah. Um, I mean, so that makes sense. So let's focus on each of those and go into a little bit of more detail. So as far as the OTC desk is concerned, you know, you mentioned that, you know, most of the, um, trading volume is actually off exchange. Uh, and, and, you know, as far as, you know, so we've had conversations previously and you've mentioned that, you know, while prices in crypto have gone down 80, 90%, the OTC volumes have actually gone up tremendously. Could you talk a little bit more about like for a lot of the, you know, people, both individuals, you know, and I'm, I'm talking about, you know, the average retail investor, but also some of the high net worth individuals, they actually might not be aware of actually what's happening behind the scenes. Um, in fact, some of the fund managers also don't know what's happening behind the scenes, especially uh, some of the fund managers who are not traders. Could you talk a little bit more about what you see since you're actually, um, you know, you kind of have like a helicopter's view on what's happening in the market since you're, you sort of sit at the apex. Could you talk more about what you see happening in the market and how this ODC trading volume has gone up over the last uh, sort of year or so? Sure. Uh, I mean, you know, so we, 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 this is our, our specific, our, our firm's view of, of uh, what has transpired in the space in the last year and uh, what we think the current situation is and then how we think the, the space is going to look like going forward, right? So as we mentioned at the start, you know, uh, we always view, view crypto and you know, approach this from a very capital market angle. We saw crypto primarily as a capital market instrument, a trading instrument. And, you know, I, I think in the big rundown and from February or March 2018, uh, what we saw there was, you know, the pricing out of a lot of uh, these uh, tech promises, right? uh, you know, a pullback from a lot of the, the noise that about, you know, million billion uh, TPS kind of technology networks uh, and it was a it was a reversal of the speculative forces and the false promises that, that drove prices much higher. Um, so you know what we saw we, we see the pullback as a sort of consolidation towards uh, a more core utility of crypto which is monetary mobility uh, ability to store and transfer value without going through financial intermediaries um, and, an, and, and crypto as an alternative and, and a disruption to traditional capital markets. Uh, so, so, you know, while, while, while we saw the space shrunk at like 90% uh, in 2018, you know, we, what we've seen on the OTC trading side is very much this a move towards monetary mobility, right? We've seen OTC trades grow in, in large sizes, uh, large trades in stable coins, um, you know, cross-border trading. And uh, so, you know, beyond the, the speculation and trading in the token market, the 10x, 20x or, or whatever, uh, what, what we see is less speculative and more uh, utility driven trades, right? So we put, like I mentioned, cross-border transactions and spe specifically for stable coins, we have observed a sort of crypto banking layer that has fallen on top of traditional banks and, and financial institutions, right? We see shadow economy, if you will. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, we see crypto, like crypto being transacted and then being stored as deposits. You know, there's a lending borrowing market that's formed, uh, financing market, interest rates, structured products, and of course, derivatives that we trade. Uh, you know, so so even though we're in a so-called crypto winter, where where prices are trading at lows, you know, we we remain very optimistic as a firm, uh, because from a capital markets perspective, uh, you know, um, what we are seeing is real infrastructure being built, uh, development of capital market structures that 
I think would pave the way for crypto to become a proper investment and trading asset class. Yeah. So in a way, in the same sense of how Keyspeed developed, a lot of it was reactionary. I don't think we knew what we were going to build when we started. We just knew that there were trading opportunities and we wanted to, to leverage them. So in that sense, as our client base grew, more and more people started coming up to us. And I guess we maybe got an edge here from the flow of clients looking for yield on products that clearly wasn't getting them anything. Um, so people would start asking us really early on, it's like, what can I do with my coin? Borrowing, lending markets, the rates began to appear. Um, people started asking us about staking. They started asking us about structured products, like how can I protect, protect my position if I have, you know, A, B, and C as my needs down the line, my two-year, three-year timeframes, and then we figure out how we could make markets for them, and then they became products for us. So in a way, the nexus sort of naturally uh, occurred for us. People just started coming to us for these things, and then we started offering them as products to everyone. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, diving a little bit deeper in terms of like, your OTC business, um, what's your typical client acquisition strategy? I mean, I know you guys are fairly active at multiple conferences. You guys have significant networks. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of other uh, relatively sort of larger players or, uh, you know, you could call them larger players. But, you know, for example, Binance is setting up an OTC desk as well. Um, so how do you compete with you know, some of the other players that are coming in and, and do you think it's going to essentially come down to price at the end of the day, or is there some sort of, you know, value add that you bring to your clients, which helps your clients stay with you guys? Yeah. I mean, price is always going to be a big factor, right? Um, the main factor. Uh, I, I think, I think we, we try and be, and we are pretty competitive on that front. Uh, but beyond that, I think, you know, like I mentioned earlier, our primary business is a prop business, you know, so the value that we add there is that we are making alpha ourselves. So the OTC spot desk is one of many offerings to a single client. He comes to us because he needs that service, but it doesn't dominate like our day-to-day -day offering. Um, it's a large business unto itself, but uh, I don't think that any shop could feed itself off OTC alone. I think mean, they will go ahead and admit that. So yes, I agree with your point as well. We're upstarts in this space. I mean, everyone doing crypto is, uh, there are certainly some big established names trying to come in, but very few of them actually have the execution alpha to, to be able to pull it off. Um, and very few of them are operating uh, in the way we do, which is 24-7, 365. So we're always online. It's shift work, basically. It's a, it's a sweatshop in a, in a way. Yeah. Um, we have always traders online to service and provide the quotes and prices. And secondly, we make sure that we offer local fiat solutions. So being able to do this in Singapore dollars, Thai bot, Indonesian rupiah, Taiwanese dollar, Hong Kong dollar, Japanese yen, Korean won, literally every single Asian currency you can think of, we handle, including you know, Canadian dollar, US dollar, you, you dream it, we can do it. So we maintain those treasuries to provide like instant settlements. And I think that's sort of where the service offering differs. Um, so a lot of handholding involved, obviously, when there's price sensitivity involved, but the ability to actually follow through and, and transact in local currencies is where we specialize, especially here in Southeast Asia. And I think one key element for us is also, uh, you know, some flexibility in terms of trade execution. Uh, it's not just, uh, you know, you ask me for a price, I show you a spread, you deal, you know, I make the spread. Uh, we do offer um, execution methods where we will deal for you in the market with the, with the liquidity that we have. And then, you know, we, we, we charge a small fee on that. That We do that as well. You know, we, we offer concierge services where you can, you know, liquidate a coin, a very illiquid coin over a week or two and you know we have bots plus physical traders monitoring that kind of trading so you know i think the, the service offering uh is a bit more varied and a bit more flexible customized as well yeah and and i think the extra effort we put in there um kind of shows because we've had some clients that have traded with us and dealt with us from day one um you know and stuck with us in in, in um in that relationship which is great and um, we're very grateful and very thankful for that. Um, that being said, we are now moving towards having more tech solutions as well for those traders that, um, or at least counterparties that require it. So we have an API that streams prices, uh, meaning that you have what's called an RFQ, uh, a request for quote. You have a simple uh, user interface, you click a button, you have a live quote for anywhere from 20, 30 seconds. Um, and that's good for very deep liquidity. I mean, you can hit it for a thousand Bitcoin uh, and it's it's actually good for those amounts. So unlike other exchanges where even getting, you know, five BTC is a problem. Um, 
so yeah, that's that's kind of where we're trying to build more tech solutions, and we've got more and more devs on board to help us out with that. Um, and hopefully, we're going to have more products rolling out and better prices on those platforms soon. So just right now, only select clients are getting that, and we're hoping to expand. Okay. And so as far as your prop desk is concerned, is that all your own capital, or do you take outside capital as well? So to date, we've not taken on any outside capital. Um, it's not like uh, we're selfish or anything, but anyone in crypto will admit there are capacity constraints and trying to grow those out, grow out those strategies scalably is very difficult when you take into account all the risk management that we have to do on the back end. So those expenses incurred and the capacity constraints mean that we want to keep as much of those profits in house as possible, hence deploying only our own balance sheet to that. Uh, that's getting more and more efficient over time with more tech solutions that we're building. And we do intend to provide our partners some avenues to deploy capital into our strategies, um, hopefully into, into Q2. And uh, we'll be happy to share that with you when it's ready. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, that sounds great. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to talk about, which Darius, again, in our conversations had brought up, um, is the fact that one of the problems in this ecosystem or, you know, keeping at least um, the two largest or, you know, uh, BTC or Ether as benchmarks for the asset class is that there's no um, underlying growth um, within BTC or Ether. Uh, and I'm presuming when, you, when, you know, when Darius said growth, he meant more from a capital markets perspective. Um, Darius, I don't know if you want to shed some light on, on this particular statement that you made and, and how that kind of, uh, you know, how, how do you juxtapose it or compare it to, uh, you know, the traditional, you know, capital markets. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, we sort of did a review of, of, of last year. And like we mentioned, the, the space has lost 90% of its market value. Uh, and, and we're wondering like what's going to happen next, right? So one of the biggest reasons uh, um, that, I mean, purely from a capital markets perspective is that uh, compared to stocks, you know, bonds, FX, uh, Bitcoin and Ether are not naturally yielding products. So, so there's no real incentive for people to build or keep big balance sheets in the space. You know, so, so for, I mean, you know, the, 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 the situation in the rundown in 2018 was one where everyone was sort of buying it on a purely speculative value. Uh, people were only holding it thinking that it would go higher and you know at, at some point when they realize that everyone is in the same position you know you have a musical chess situation where everyone just starts liquidating the, the balance sheet uh and then now you know we end up in this space in this point in time where everyone's like okay you know is there a reason for you to hold crypto and to hold it in big size the answer is usually no because you know compared to like stocks and, and bonds right for example stocks you have underlying growth business growth you have dividends for bonds you have a coupon you know, FX and, FX and swaps, you do have a funding curve where, where you do get some yield out of these assets. Uh, whereas Bitcoin Ether, there's no natural yield. Uh, it's purely speculative in value. Um, so because of this, there's no real incentive to build balance sheet, you know. Uh, and uh, um, it's purely, you know, speculation on that there will be some revolutionary adoption of a certain token that would drive the price up. So because of that, you know, uh, we, we think that what the space needs really is something that gives a yield to the tokens. And uh, we think that, that the answer is in derivatives, in, in options and in forwards where, where your holdings can generate yield. And therefore, that's an incentive for you to start building balance sheet. You know, it could, be a, it, it could come in the form of uh, structured products or just basically, you know, for example, if a miner starts mining coin, as in, is, is mining coin, instead of liquidating the coin for cash, uh, they could be selling call options on them, making up to 50% yield on it. Uh, and that's a big incentive for them to keep the coin. Um, you know, so we think that this is something that uh, could take the space out of this rut. Um, that we call it crypto bill. Yeah, you know, um, where, where, where you know, everyone is just sort of like looking at each other and who's going to speculate on something. But the yield would encourage many, multiple parties, institutional parties to, to start building balance sheet. And I think that that could be the key for growth going forward. 
I think we were all promised that institutional wall of money, and that was always a, a phrase tossed around at conferences over the last year or so. Then you know, let's let's look at the truth of it. That that money never really came in, or maybe it came and it went. Who knows? Um, the the reality is uh, the example here when a large hedge fund wants to come in and build a balance sheet in the space, they don't have the instruments that are required to protect themselves or hedge their entry into crypto. Uh, and those are the kind of products that we want to be building so that we can facilitate the growth as a whole of the space through incentivizing people to hold and create a balance sheet. And those instruments are expected of in traditional capital markets. There's no reason why if we think crypto is going to become a mainstream asset in the next five years, we shouldn't have them in crypto as well. So are you hinting towards uh, more on the text? You mentioned um, a little while ago, uh, Josh, that, uh, you know, you're building out certain infrastructure or you're actually uh, leveraging or trying to scale up a little bit through technology. Is that what you're hinting towards in terms of actually building out the trading infrastructure so that the institutions are able to get on ramped into crypto? I would say yes and no on this one in the sense that when you have there are trusted third parties in the space that are required for settlements and clearing, and they need to be neutral. So they tend not to be the dealer desks like us who actually do that for the space. Um, so we are doing that in tandem with third parties to help that exist. So we have those avenues to settle and clear trades. Um, the tools and the infrastructure we're building is more around uh, our own trading strategies and how we can deploy a balance sheet as well as potentially capital raised into those strategies. Um, as well as tech that leverages, you know, this is not in total ignorance of the, the qualities that come from blockchain decentralization, but some of the solutions that come from the tech as well. So we've been looking at a few protocols out there which are providing, you know, decentralized settlements and clearing, and we don't want to, we want to be ahead of the curve when those come to maturity. And so we're trying to build tools that supplement or, or support the growth of those tools. Yeah, but, you know, to answer your question as well, we tend to think that the crypto space would follow more of FX, right? Where FX derivatives are traded almost 100% OTC. So the, 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 tech, the tech part of it, you know, is, is more of a streamlining efficiency solution. But, you know, when you trade options and forwards, I think it's going to be very, very OTC focused. Uh, and I think I expect that to be the channel where, where most of the volume goes through. So th these would be uh, chats where you deal and you do in specific customized contracts, you know, um, and uh, that I think is where we will be focused on, you know, building out a uh, option and forwards ecosystem. And this would be not just us, but you know, inter, inter dealer as well. You know, we brought we brought uh, the other OTC guys together to sort of come up with standardizations uh, to be able to have a uh, a more professional uh, sort of ecosystem. For, for trading derivatives. Yeah, so I'd say a lot of the tools we're building on the one hand are client focused, so that like, how do we make the most streamlined KYC AML process? So getting onboarded with us is the easiest possible thing. And going forward as regulations come into play, how do we make sure we're fully compliant and you know, you can spin up the reports that you need, we can audit automatically and have the most efficient possible operations and back office system here. All sounds very boring tech, but at the end of the day, without that, you don't have a smooth running shop. Um, and, and secondly, we want to be able to have the in-house ability to create tools, you know, uh, whenever we need them. And that's why we're hiring that sort of you know, top dev talent as well. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned a couple of things. So one is regulatory compl compliance. The other is institutional acceptance. Um, so let's talk about the institutional acceptance first. So, you know, um, BACT has been pushing their uh, launch day um, further and further behind. Uh, back to, you know, they've done a massive, massive fundraise, or at least from a crypto perspective, massive, not maybe not from a ICE, uh, which is the company running, you know, stock exchange and some other exchanges around the world, maybe not so much from their perspective, but at least from the crypto perspective, it was a huge uh, fundraise. Um, I mean, from, from what I hear uh, from, you know, some of the, some of the traders and industry insiders is that there's actually not, um, too much action that BACT is anticipating at the moment from institutions, which is why, you know, the, the date, is, date for launch has been uh, pushed back. I don't know if you have any views on that or if you see any activity from your end, uh, which uh, either agrees with whatever I just said or actually disproves what I just said. Um, 
coincidentally, they were just here yesterday in our office having a okay. <laughs> So a mixed answer to that. Um, right now, the futures crypto liquidity is very concentrated in unregulated exchange uh, exchanges, rather, um, and a lot of it is in Bitmax. You know, because the barrier to entry there is a bit lower, uh, primarily in that it is settled in it is it is funded and settled in coin terms. Whereas uh, um, guys like Bart, ICE, CME, CBOE, um, they are still entrenched in uh, traditional markets and the infrastructure around that. So firstly, you have to be, you have to settle in fiat. You have to go through a clearer. You have to have an account with a clearer, KYC, etc., etc. You know, so the barriers to entry are a bit higher. Um, that to me is the primary reason why they haven't gained the kind of traction. Uh, that as well as the fact that uh, BitMEX offers a lot more margin, so you know it's a lot more for a lot more leverage for trading. So what what, you, what we tend to see is that you know CME CBOE tends to have uh, the more institutional players who already have lines with the clearers and whatnot. Um, but you know I think BACT is an interesting solution because they are trying to be a bit less institutional in in that uh, you know they're trying to to offer a product that's a lot more palatable. Um, and compliant as well. Uh, so it remains to be seen. I, I think I think the space does need a solution that is uh, properly regulated, you know, uh, with both institutional and retail guys, uh, you know. So I, I think they're trying to strike that balance um, and hopefully, hopefully they do because it, it would be very positive for the ecosystem. Yeah, I'd say this as well. I mean, you know, there's been a regime change in crypto and with that comes the changing of the guard. I think we've seen a lot of the Hustlers in the space kind of drop out and, and more mature capital markets professionals are, are taking the lead here. And ICE and BACT is, is one good example. So as practitioners coming from capital markets before, we're very accustomed to slow going regulatory changes. Being patient is, is the name of the game here and we're building a business around that. We're not looking for a sort of 10x upside tomorrow. Nice as that would be to have. I think those times have come and gone. So the sum of it is with a product like BACT, which is CFTC regulated and extremely compliant, but hopefully practitioner friendly, um, is that hopefully it'll be worth the wait. And we think that they're going at a good pace and we are hoping that we can contribute to their success as well. Yeah. Uh, the other point that we were talking about previously was regulatory compliance. Have you at all had any interactions with uh, the local uh, with monetary authority of Singapore here in Singapore, or uh, since you know most of it is actually you know your capital, it's prop trading. You don't you don't actually come under the purview. But is there any sort of regulatory constraints that you felt, or any conversations that you've had um, with MAS uh, that have been positive or negative? Well, MAS has start as has you know made a move to to regulate the space and we are we intend to be 100% compliant. Uh, we have, from day one, we've had a full compliance team, uh, risk management team, uh, even though it was not nece- was not strictly necessary. Um, our risk manager here is, uh, was on the AML committee of a bank uh, before, one of the local banks, you know, so we, we pay a lot of attention to that. Uh, we've been, we've adhered to the uh, requirements, even though there weren't any strict requirements for it, and I think that has uh, helped us, you know, in terms of getting a, a head start on that front. Um, so you know, when 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 the payments, local payments bill, sort of the virtual currency uh, license comes comes into play, we we intend to be we intend to apply for it and 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 uh, be 100% compliant to op- to operate in Singapore. Yeah. yeah, I think I think it's always been the case that we've had to operate on the fringes here. I think anyone in crypto and trying to do this and the space like Singapore has to, um, but always under the auspices of feeling like the company should be regulated. And we always waited for the right regulations to come along to the extent and very much to our own cost as well. With lawyers, we've just spent a couple hundred thousand dollars renovating uh, our office to be com- regulatory compliant, having the China walls between the trading teams uh, and the back office and the mid office and the way that we have run our booking systems. Um, we have some very, very senior external advisors who are themselves still heads of trading in large financial institutions in Singapore. And I think Darius is actually maybe not given enough credit to our chief risk officer, who himself built a lot of the AML KYC procedures for the banks in Singapore for the last 20 years. Uh, only we've 
in lieu of us not having that experience, we've pulled a very senior old guy out of retirement to do that for us. And I think it's much to our, uh, I think proof is in the pudding, right? We're one of the few shops able to maintain Singapore dollar fiat banking uh, because they see our systems are in place and that they are compliant. Yeah. I mean, beyond whatever we've talked about, is there anything that occupies um, your mind share, both Josh and Darius? Uh, you know, we've talked about a, a bunch of things, but is there anything beyond this that that you guys think about or feel strongly about or have strong opinions about? Yeah, I know. I mean, we, we continue to think that that the what we the activity from the activity we see in the space and the potential disruptions that the space is highly undervalued. You know, um, 120 billion dollar market cap for the whole crypto market cap today is relatively speaking very very small. You know, it's not even like a, a, a half the size of a normal bank's balance sheet. And this is, you're talking about the entire global crypto space here. So the space is undervalued and, and we see the structures being put in place, you know, that, that, that would build a multi-trillion dollar market. Um, and uh, we want to be uh, first movers in that. Uh, we think that the opportunity is there, you know, a lot of people have given up on crypto saying that, ah, you know, this thing is crazy, you know, quite 90%. Um, we think it's far from it, right? Um, the, this time is a time to build, you know, it's, it's a time to consolidate and, and to look at, uh, you know, where, where the space is heading. Uh, in terms of disruptions, we think that there are a lot of disruptions to traditional finance and especially in FX. Uh, you know, we, we see the, the, uh, the, 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 the current Asian FX landscape is, is dislocated, you know, remains uh, inefficient. And I think there are a lot of disruptions there as well. Um, you know, so we generally optimistic and we're looking, we're working very hard, not, to, not just to grow our business, but I think our business is all contingent on this, the whole space growing, the whole ecosystem growing. And I think that's what we're focusing on at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, just to keep that organized, there's a couple of fronts here, put your money where your mouth is. We're aggressively hiring. So we wouldn't be doing that if we didn't see an opportunity. And secondly, um, we're actually still deploying a lot of capital into infrastructure projects in emerging markets, you know. This is our home turf, Southeast Asia is our backyard, and that's what we want to support because we think that's where a lot of the growth is going to come from. Uh, and secondary to that, Latin America, because I have connections there, we do spend a lot of time and effort on, on projects out there as well. Okay. What's the, I mean, I just want to end on this note. What, what's the longer term vision, like say 5, 10, if you had to project 5, 10 years, 15 years from today, uh, if crypto is still alive, but what, what would you guys want to be known for? Or what would you guys want to be doing? Well, I mean, um, to answer your question, the first part, you know, how will crypto look like in five, ten years? I, it might not be in, I mean, it might not be how it looks like now, you know, it might not, might not be Bitcoin or Ether, but we think that, that crypto would be traded, not just by retail, but by corporates, by sovereigns. You know, I think, uh, you know, we, last year, you know, we always say that last year, people were always looking at how crypto can be used as, it can be turned into fiat, you know, crypto into fiat, right? How tokens can be used as payment. I think what, what we think would be how fiat can be turned into, can be used as crypto, right? And, and, and uh, that, 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 that move will be the move that is large. Um, and, uh, you know, so the way that we see it happening, uh, not exactly sure what the path will be, but five, 10 years, when it is uh, traded by all parties, you know, um, we want to be a cornerstone financial institution. Um, guys who are there first, guys who will help to set up uh, standards, guys, just help help to set regulations, um, and and you know, be professionals in the space, I guess. So think um, in a more lofty view, Goldman Sachs and crypto down the line, big specialization in in crypto derivatives, and if there's a project that we're pushing that we really want to see come to fruition, it's a lot of the FX tokens. We call them FX tokens in Asia. Um, that's a whole other topic by itself, but think about the Philippine stablecoin, the the peso token or the Indonesian rupiah token, two massive markets where remittances can be massively disrupted. Um, and we've been spending a lot of time engaging with the central banks locally to build those products out. I think more recently you've seen, we did in partnership with um, KRWB, the Korean one back token. Um, and that's something that we're kind of spearheading more as a passion project and something that we think will really grow the space. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's really where the direction is going for us. Yeah. Darius, Josh, it's been a pleasure. Likewise. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tusha. Thank you.